I'm Brad Stone in San Francisco, in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Uber IPO details. The ride-hailing startup is planning to offer shares in a range of $44 to $50, aiming to raise as much as $10 billion. Plus, Amazon reports first quarter earnings. How did the e-commerce giant measure up on cloud services, ad sales, and its many other businesses? And the future of mobility. Lime's global footprint is expanding, but competition is growing as well. We'll speak with Chief Operating Officer Joe Krause. But first to our top story today. Uber is said to plan its IPO price range of between $44 to $50 a share, which could value the ride-hailing company at up to $90 billion. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Technologies Eric Newcomer, who helped break the story. Eric, $90 billion, that is not the $120 billion that, it, that bankers were promising. What's happened here? I think Uber wants to set conservative expectations. It's watched Lyft and Pinterest, you know, Pinterest setting below its last private valuation, Lyft trading below uh, its IPO price, and just wants to make sure that it gets the narrative right. And I think would rather take the hits for being very close to its last private round than get itself in a situation where it has to backtrack later on. Eric, it's obviously early and the price range could and probably will go up, but can you, does, can you, can you discern anything about the enthusiasm among the bankers for Uber's other businesses like Uber Eats? Yeah, I think Uber Eats is a real question mark. DoorDash, with the help of you know SoftBank money, has been able to really grow against Uber. And so I think you know what Uber wanted to be sort of an unabashed growth story in food delivery now has a much bigger asterisk by it. And so I think questions around Uber Eats are sort of tampering expectations for Uber's IPO ever so slightly. A lot of competition all around the world. You mentioned Lyft. How much is, is the Lyft uh, saga over the last month where the stock has been down considerably weighing on the minds of Uber's executives and its bankers? I mean, they're certainly watching it, right? Because there is no obvious sort of comp for Uber. Lyft is clearly the best uh, point of comparison. So that's certainly on their minds. On the other hand, Uber has a much more global story, you know, ride hailing sort of in many places in the world and then stakes in businesses if it doesn't. Uber Eats, which even if it's sort of not as good as they would like, is still a big growing business that sort of came out of nowhere and then it's got freight, you know, so it has a much bigger story than Lyft. So there's definitely a lot of reason to compare the two, but then Uber wants to continue to remind people, but we're a very different company. Okay, Bloomberg Technologies' Eric Newcomer, thank you, and thank good you. job breaking this news. So now to earnings. Amazon reported quarterly profit that exceeded analyst estimates, demonstrating the company's focus on cloud computing, advertising, and other high-margin businesses continues to pay off. Amazon also continued to narrow its loss on its international operations, which helped boost profits. However, it's not all good news. Outlook for the second quarter is less stellar. Revenue and income guidance are both a bit light. To discuss further, we're joined by Wedbush Managing Director Michael Pachter and Jeffrey's analyst Brent Thill. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Michael, let's start with you. You know, you've been an Amazon bull. Lots to like here today. Obviously, this is now a more profitable company than has historically been true. And yet, you know, so, some of these warning signs about future spending and future growth. What do you make of the quarter? You know, the upside is because they're, they generated 43% margin and they just can't spend all that money. I mean, they have $25 billion of gross profit and they managed to only spend $20 billion of it. And that's, that's the story. This company is, has run out of things to spend money on. I mean, obviously, they're going to keep building fulfillment centers, but that's not going to grow materially year over year. They're going to build the same 50 or 100 every year. And they're just minting money. I think the, the negative in the story is I think investors don't appreciate that the third party mix went up yet again. Bezos said it was 58% of sales last year. It was about 60% of sales this quarter if we use the same math. And that's what's driving the gross margin, that and advertising in AWS. So it's a great margin story. Investors are confused by the top line and they get spooked by the guidance. So the stock isn't up enough on this print but it was up 
about 100 bucks in the last couple of weeks. Brent, Phil, it really is a remarkable story, right? This is a company we think of as an online retailer, but it's now primarily a third-party marketplace, a cloud computing company, and, and increasingly an advertising company. What, what does this quarter tell you? I think, you know, Michael hit on the margin, right? Revenue in line margin uh, doubled year on year. And so if you think about, we, we have a call that margins can continue to double. Uh, you look at the, the big internet names, they have declining margins, right? Facebook, Google, a uh, number are, are, are spending to keep up with Amazon. So it's somewhat of a rare bird, if you will, in terms of that, that, ex, that, that rev, uh, revenue growth is decelerating, but you're seeing the margin improve. So I, I think we, we think the biggest concern is that Wall Street is still felt that this should be a 20% top line story. We think it, it's more reasonable to think about mid to high teens and with acquisitions, they get to 20% growth. Uh, but you look at the margin profile again, I think that that 7.5% margin can go to, in, into the teens easily. Uh, and that's driven off of AWS, the ad business, uh, and the recurring you know, subscription business, which will continue to compound. And, and so you can sell a bunch of low margin deodorant, uh, but you have a lot higher margin business in the software business, which is gonna Going to give investors, uh, you know, more predictability and, and, and better confidence around the future of, of cash flow. Well, Michael, let's talk a little bit more about the ad business that Brent just mentioned. Uh, you know, they tucked that into the other category, and, and the the uh, growth rate year over year was about 34 percent. You know, but this was a business that was almost doubling in size in previous quarters. So, you know, is is there any reason to think that the ad business for Amazon is slowing down, or is or, or these kind of accounting minutia? that account for the slowdown? No, I think it's perfectly correlated to the sum of online store sales and third-party seller services uh, sales growth. So if you add those two categories together, that tells you the activity on the site. And search at Amazon is people looking for a coffee maker, and the results are gonna pop up just like looking for a coffee maker on Google, and they're getting paid for that ad because purchase intent is nearly 100% when you're searching on Amazon. So, you know, it's going to be perfectly correlated to, to purchases on Amazon, and I think anybody who models advertising to grow significantly faster than that is just modeling it wrong. Uh, Brent, um, I want to ask you about the international business. You know, it has improved, uh, but still just a 9% growth rate and an operating loss. So, so how much of that can we trace to India, where Amazon's made quite a large investment? And, of course, some of the policies have changed around allowing non-Indian sellers to operate in the country. I, I would say the biggest blemish in the quarter was obviously the international miss relative to where we were all at. The street was looking for... Uh, a much higher number than North American business, you know, picked up the, the picked up the slack, if you will. So, internationals uh, historically has been very wavy. It's been hit and miss uh, every other quarter, and you know, as they expand into these markets, they're you know they're not the same dynamic as in the U.S. Right? So, you go to Australia, the delivery speed's not the same. So, do they have to invest in a new infrastructure to get delivery up to where they want? So, the goals that we all would like to see here. Probably not. Uh, again, back to Michael's point about you know the straight line of the of ad business. It, it, you can't really straight line the international business. It's it's going to be lumpy. Uh, so we, we think there's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we've traveled to many of the countries that they're in and asked end users about their experience in Japan and uh, in Europe and in in South you know in, in South Asia. And there's clearly uh, this is where it's headed. It's the same dynamic. First, it was about buying a book and then placing more items in the basket, adding subscriptions, and then adding other services. So we think the overall basket size continues to grow and is going to track to what, what the U.S. Uh, did. So right now, again, I, I think that was, if you, you're looking for a blemish, it was the top line just achieving international missing. And then the ad business, I think everyone believed that it would grow faster than it did. But again, I think pretty minor relative to a, a company that just blew out the earnings number. Uh, Michael, let's talk about the next quarter a little bit. Uh, estimates have come in a little bit light, uh, but I think obviously spending is one thing that investors pay a lot of attention to when it comes to Amazon. So many of these growth cycles over the years, we've both followed the company for a long time. What are, what are the chances, do you think, that you know that Jeff Bezos does find a way to spend all this capital the company is now generating, and we go we're going into another period of high hiring and expenditures on not only new servers but new kinds of technologies. 
You know, I think uh, that that Facebook and Amazon and probably Google have all this in common. They all promise to spend a ton of money and then they manage not to do it. You just saw Facebook drop their, you know, their spending growth, their OPEX growth by 300 basis points. Um, Amazon just can't manage to deploy the capital. I expect Google's going to do the same thing. Uh, I'd say there is, you know, a 0.01% chance that Bezos manages to spend more than he takes in and we suddenly see earnings decline. Uh, they, they guide low and they crush. They beat by a billion dollars this quarter. They're gonna beat by a billion dollars in perpetuity until the sell side figures it out and then the stock goes to 2,500 and it's fully priced in. So uh, no, they're not gonna spend this money. There are no initiatives that are stupid. There's no fire phone anymore. Uh, the only thing I would say that some people think is stupid is content spending. You know, buying, you know, paying a billion dollars for uh, Lord of the Rings, but uh, even that might work out. Okay, We're, we have to leave it there. Michael Pactor at Wedbush and Brent Thill of Jefferies, thank you both for joining us. Coming up, the chip sector has been on a rise since the start of the year and outperforming the broader markets. We look at the earnings of one major player, Intel, next. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Intel are falling in after-hours trading. The drop comes as the chipmaker cut its revenue for the full year, as CEO Bob Swan says the company is, quote, taking a more cautious view of the year. To discuss in New York, Bloomberg cross-asset reporter Sarah Ponzak, and in the studios with me here, Bloomberg Tech's Nico Grant. Nico, let's start with you. An 8% after-hours drop in Intel stock, what is going on? Mm -hmm. There's very little good news in this report for Intel. Uh, essentially, what is happening is the data center business at Intel, which is making chips for the servers that help run the modern internet, also computer networks, uh, also the same chips that big cloud computing companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google use uh, in order to build out their presence around the world, that business has been sliding. Uh, we saw it last quarter, we're seeing it again uh, for the current period that we're in. And the problem for Intel is that this is a very profitable business unit and it's also been a great source of revenue growth over the last decade. Well, another worry has to be that the next business, the smartphone chip business, Intel just got out of that, right? And, in, and, and then Apple went and settled its dispute with Qualcomm. You know, are investors worried about that and what the future holds for Intel? Well, I think Intel was always much weaker when it comes to smartphone chips than Qualcomm is. And so it was not going to be a huge part of the company's business unless they were able to turn that around. I think the expectation was always that Qualcomm and Apple would, would settle. It was just on what terms they, they would. And we saw, as you said, Intel said that it would pull out of the business after Qualcomm and, and Apple decided to end all litigation. But, you know, in this quarter, what investors are really paying attention to is that they're not going to see the improvement that Intel had promised in the data center business. Bob Swan told Bloomberg earlier t this afternoon that essentially it's taking longer uh, than they had anticipated for that demand to pick up because all of their major clients already have stockpiles of these chips and aren't buying new ones. Well, Sarah Ponzak, you've pointed out that the semiconductor indexes has, have outperformed the S&P 500. Is this now a dramatic reversal of that trend? We'll absolutely see what happens. If you look at the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. It's pretty amazing, up 35% this year compared to the S&P, which is up 17%. And that's why going into this earnings season, there has been such a large focus around semiconductor stocks because the narrative has been that demand is waning. Yet even as company after company comes out and issues warning, we haven't seen that turn around yet. Early this week, we heard from the likes of Texas Instruments, their CEO issued a warning, and we still saw the semiconductor index rise. We saw Texas Instruments rise. Well, now now we've heard from the likes of Intel. Xilinx, we also heard from today, had its worst day since 2000, and that is starting to weigh on the semiconductor index. Now, next week, we'll also hear from the likes of Qualcomm, which is the largest holding in the index. Intel is the fifth largest. So as we hear more and more, we'll have to see if there actually is a straw that you could say breaks the camel's back if we hear too many warnings on demand. 
Sarah, so many other earnings this week I want to ask you about. Uh, Tesla reported yesterday, Wedbush's Daniel Ives called it one of the top debacles in his career. Is that overstating things a little bit? Quite the statement. I don't know if he is overstating. Yes, he is probably the most dramatic on the street with the most dramatic statement out. However, you look at Wall Street analysts across the street and they are not happy right now. Because when you look at Tesla results, you have a record drop in deliveries. You also have one of their largest debt payments that they had to pay down. And that puts cash balance and free cash flow at the lowest in three years, which is an issue for Tesla. They've had such an issue becoming profitable, and Elon Musk keeps saying they will reach profitability eventually. But when you see numbers like these, it makes you wonder how long is it actually going to take. And ahead of the earnings report, there were many out on the street that came out and said, maybe the company did hold that conference earlier on the week on autonomous driving to kind of shine a light on that instead of the numbers. Well, that's not what you want to see because clearly you, could, you look at the numbers, we're seeing Tesla fall. Now it's below 250 and that's acted as support. It didn't act as support this time. Shares are at the lowest since 2017. And Elon Musk now saying that there is merit to the idea of raising capital after saying for at least a year that he wouldn't. Nico, I want to touch quickly on Microsoft at the doorway of a $1 trillion valuation. Why was that a good quarter for Microsoft? Mm -hmm. it, it was not a debacle for Microsoft this quarter. And the reason why is because there was broad-based broad growth at the company. But it was led in particular by the company's cloud computing efforts. Uh, we saw that Azure, which is its uh, public cloud, it grew 73%, which was a touchdown from last quarter, but it's continuing to grow at these massive, massive rates. Uh, Microsoft also got a boost from Office products, uh, Windows 365 cloud products. And so everyone was very happy there. The sentiment was very high among investors because even small divisions at Microsoft, like its surface line of devices, which by the way, now makes Microsoft the fifth biggest PC maker in the US, uh, even that did well. I mean, everything increased. Okay, we could have three trillion dollar tech companies companies before too long. Bloomberg, Sarah Ponzak, and Nico Grant, thank you both. Thank you. And we'll be speaking with Intel CEO Bob Swan on the company's earning results on Bloomberg TV Friday. Coming up, Amazon is expanding its cloud business in Asia, how it's managing to compete with local giant Alibaba amid trade tensions between China and the U.S. Next, this is Bloomberg. As we discussed earlier in the hour, revenue from Amazon Web Services jumped 41% in the first quarter. Meanwhile, AWS is pushing deeper into the Asian market. Earlier this week, Amazon's cloud services arm announced the launch of a new infrastructure region in Hong Kong as it continues to grow its business in China. AWS's managing director of Greater China, Alex Young, sat down with Bloomberg's David Ingalls in Hong Kong to discuss. Globally, there's about a little bit over four trillion dollars spent on IT. Okay. All right, uh, by enterprise, it's okay. not consumer. So about ten percent is being spent more directly on the cloud-like uh, infrastructure or capabilities or functions. So it's a still a very uh, early stage so for the cloud market. Ten percent of three trillion. Four is, trillion. Is, oh, 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 yeah. Four trillion is cloud. Yeah. How big is China of, of cloud? Do we know? Uh, well, there's similarly they have about four trillion RMB. Okay. IT enterprise IT spending is about right. eight to nine percent uh, that is you know being spent on this so called uh, cloud infrastructure and cloud services. Uh, you, you, you can't tell me what your market share is. Can you? No, we cannot disclose that. Uh, how yeah. fast are you growing? Well, we have been growing very rapidly. All right, in the Greater China region. Uh, we have been enjoying really high double-digit growth for the last five years. D double digit is anywhere from 11 percent to 99 percent. Are you closer yes. to 11 or are you closer it's to 99 percent? Uh, it's close to the, the, the <laughs> really close to triple digit, let me put it this way. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in terms of competition, mm. apart from yourself, because I'm sure you'll say you guys have the best offering, who has the next best offering out there? Well, I think the, it's also coming from the customer, right? Depends on the customer, you know, and also where where the customer, what industry that the customers are coming from? They, are, they have special needs coming, you know, right. for customers coming from different background or industry. So I would say because we AWS has been operating cloud services almost hitting 14 years, mm. right? And we have 
built, listen to customers over the last 14 years, we have built so much capability, 140 of them, and right. we are continuing to grow that, and with thousands of uh, smaller functions and services, and tailored to the needs of media industry, financial sectors, government sectors, mm. all right, and you know, the internet space, right? right? Which is where, how we started the business early on. So we continue to develop that. And we, you know, uh, we also work with a lot of a, uh, recently, we also work with a lot of a smart manufacturing. I mean, as you hear, you know, early on, right? You know, right. we have that's been partnering with uh, Volkswagen, <laughs> right? Yeah, that, that's the trend that Beijing is pushing anyway for yes. them to move up the value chain in manufacturing. Uh, my question to you is, you don't want to grow just as fast as the industry is growing, yes. right? You want to grow faster than just so, I mean, that alludes to, of course, market share. How do you, how do you compete then, greater China, especially on the mainland? Mm -hmm. Because you're an American company. Uh, politics has been an issue surrounding tech as well. It's not as if the, the services did not exist before AWS mm -hmm. in yeah. China. So how, how do you convince a Chinese customer that it is safe mm -hmm. to use your server? Well, first of all, we are so proud of what we have been doing in terms of how we protect customer data, all right? Uh, we put, you know, security, uh, data privacy, data protection as a number one priority. From a technology and operational point of view, we, we you know, a lot of a regulator, you know, around the world, including those from China, they will recognize that we are, we are one of the best. I have to ask this question. Um, just a contrast in the business environment is really a function of regulation in these markets. So you have the U.S. If, if, the, if a government agency in the U.S. wants client data, you will fight, of course, to uh, to what the law allows yep. to keep that client data from getting into the government's hands. Mm -hmm. How does that dynamic apply in China if the government wants client data? Because I would imagine sanctity of the data is paramount to you and to your client. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, when, uh, wherever we operate, whether it's in China or US or in Europe or now in Hong Kong, we will have to comply with the local laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. So when there is a government agency or regulator they come in with a legitimate you know, uh, subpoena or whatever, then we will look at it. Now we have a legal team to look at that, all right, and see whether, whether it's a legitimate. If it is a legitimate, then uh, again, if it is not against the local law, we will inform our customer at the same time. So that we will give the customer a time window to defend themselves, all right? So that is more on the process why. That was Amazon Web Services Managing Director of Greater China, Alex Young. Coming up, over the past two years, scooter startups like Lime have disrupted transportation and ignited an investor frenzy. But will they be able to compete now that ride-sharing giants Lyft and Uber are hitting the public market? We'll discuss the micro-mobility climate next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology, and be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Technology, I'm Brad Stone. In June of 2017, Lime launched its first fleet of pedal bikes. Now, less than two years later, the electronic bike and scooter company is celebrating over 50 million rides worldwide. Joining me to discuss is Lime Chief Operating Officer, Joe Kraus. Joe, nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. It's, it's hard to believe it's only been two years. Uh, investors obviously continue to be very excited about the scooter business. I guess my question is, now that we've just come through a winter, and I would imagine that to some extent this business is seasonal, are riders still enthous enthusiastic about micro-mobility, scooters and e-bikes? Yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, we just celebrating 50 million rides globally. One of the things that's interesting is it's only been 13 months since the companies offered scooters. We're in 85 different markets in 26 different countries. And the thing that amazes me is both how fast the growth of the business is, which is really a function of how useful the service is, but also how global it is. 
I think if you look at our business, Europe is an unbelievably great market. Those cities were built for horses and humans, and cars were always a retrofit. And so all across the world, and especially Europe, you see micromobility taking off. I'm not sure North American cities were built for scooters. <laughs> and I think we have that problem here in San Francisco, right? I mean, to what extent has the company had success working with cities to create kind of safe solutions, safe avenues for micromobility? Yeah. So. Um, if you look, there are about 300 million trips a day in the United States in cities that are less than a mile and a half of driving or over a half a mile of walking. That's the total addressable market. If you consider utilization of a vehicle of about four trips per vehicle per day, you need about 75 million scooters in the entire country to serve all of that need. Even if you take 10% of that, seven and a half million scooters, there's a limited amount of scooters that currently cities are allowing to be deployed. And we're just working with every city to try to get more and more scooters available in their city. Because everywhere we go, we see an incredible adoption of that vehicle type. And the primary reason is, one, it's the closest thing to a magic carpet the world's ever seen. You get on and you glide. Second is time savings. So I commute every day from the Caltrain station in San Francisco to my office, 20 minutes in a car, seven minutes in a scooter. That's three days of my life I get back every single year through using it. And what we're working with in cities is how do you make it safer, protected bike lanes and separating high-speed traffic from low-speed traffic. And we're working with many cities across the country to make that happen. Uh, you guys have been prolific fundraisers at Lime, as have some of your competitors. You've raised over $700 million. You know, we just reported that Uber is ready to price its IPO uh, between $44 and $50. They could be valued at as much as $90 billion. You know, to what extent is a successful Uber IPO important for, for Lime? I think it's important. Uh, full disclosure, through my prior job, I have at Google exposure Ventures. at Google Ventures. I have some exposure to Uber shares, so just for full disclosure. Um, but I think it's really important, mainly because I think there's a revolution happening, which is what I would call the great unbundling of the car. The model for the last 100 years has been you own a car and you do everything with it, short and long trips, trips in a city, trips out of the city. But that's changing. It's changing because the internet and smartphones in your pocket allow you to summon a vehicle. It's what Uber taught us. Summon a vehicle when you want it without having to own the vehicle. Well, the next step is happening too, which is instead of using a car for everything, you can use small vehicles for short trips and bigger vehicles for longer trips. And so this unbundling of the car, be it access over ownership or being it small vehicles for short trips, bigger vehicles for larger trips is happening. And I think the Uber IPO is just another proof point in this mega trend across the world. I would imagine you had some exposure to Uber's financial since you were an investor, but is there anything specific that you took away from Uber or Lyft's S1? Um, well, I think one is, at least as it relates to Lime, the investment of both companies in micromobility and the importance that both of those companies put on the idea of using smaller vehicles for short trips, um, both to the benefit of the economics of the business, but also because there's a tremendous time savings and so there's customer demand. Though that was one of the things that stood out to me. But that means they're competitors. And of course, Uber acquired one of your rivals, Jump Bikes. To, how, how serious do you take the fact that they're now coming, you know, quite deliberately coming into your market and, and with new capital station? Well, we have a great partnership with Uber. Um, like in any early market, the definition between a competitor and a partner ends up being a little bit fluid. So I think things are going to evolve over the next couple of years. So we have a deal with Uber where we're, gonna, we're integrated into the app. Um, where Lime scooters appear in that app. And at the same time, of course, they offer their own fleet through Jump. I'm not particularly worried about it because right now, 99% of people have never ridden any scooter of any kind. Uh, and so the mar most of the market is ahead of us. So I'm not terribly worried. Do you anticipate consolidation in this business and how soon will it happen? It's a capital intensive business. I mean, you mentioned how much money we've raised. Um, we're really focused on excellence of operations, which allows for really positive unit economics. And this is a complicated business. We have a supply chain in China that then builds bespoke scooters and sends them to these 85 markets across the world in these 26 countries. And then they operated by local teams. Um, it's a complicated operational business. And getting it right and making positive margin is hard. So what do I expect to happen? Right now, there's some big competitors. Um, and a bunch of smaller companies. I do expect, because it's a capital-intensive business, that scale players are going to win. 
And I think that many of these smaller players are going to struggle to raise capital later in the year and early in 2020. I don't know whether that's consolidation necessarily, but I think scale matters in the business. And how big is the geographic opportunity? So you talked about Europe and obviously you started in, in the U.S. You know, what countries are you investing in right now? Um, I think if you look, we are on five continents. Um, so we're investing pretty much globally across the world. Uh, for example, just a couple of days ago, we launched Bogota, Colombia, and Montevideo uh, in Uruguay. So we have a wide geographic footprint from Australia, New Zealand, in through Latin America, both Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Tel Aviv. Um, we're just all over the world. Is there and anywhere where it doesn't work? You know, I think there are some markets I would point to Southeast Asia. I would point to China, for example, right now, where it's actually illegal. Uh, these scooters are illegal because they're classified as cars. Um, I think India would be tough. There's some markets where... I don't where, think you want to ride a scooter on a, on a, on a road in India. Uh, well, yes, exactly. Could get you, have, interest. you have a combination of um, willingness to pay, infrastructure, uh, ability to move vehicles around. So there are some markets where I think mostly concentrated in Southeast Asia that are going to be harder to operate. Well, last question and quickly, safety. Obviously there have been lawsuits uh, from Lime riders who have been injured, uh, lawsuits from riders uh, riding scooters from other companies. How do you improve the safety and make sure that people are operating the scooters and the e-bikes responsibly? So our goal is to make a scooter safer than a bike. We do a ton of things in this regard. Obviously, one of the things you can do is give away lots of helmets, and we have over a quarter million helmets that we've given away. But the second is, this is a new vehicle type. So rider education on how you ride them, rider education on where you ride them. And then lastly, working with cities, cities all across the United States have a program called Vision Zero. They want zero pedestrian fatalities, and a big part of that is protected bike lanes and separating cars from pedestrians and bikers, and we're working with cities to develop more of those. And as you said, wearing a helmet does seem like a smart idea. Yeah. All right, Joe Kraus, a Lime COO, thank you very much for joining us. Coming up, e-commerce meets the high end. We talk to the CEO of First Dibs about the online world of antiques. That's next. This is Bloomberg. India's high court lifted the ban of the popular TikTok app in the country. It was blocked by Google and Apple on concerns the app was exposing children to disturbing content. It's a victory for parent company ByteDance, which was valued at $75 billion last year. It also comes as a relief for other startups hoping to cash in on the world's fastest growing smartphone market. The e-commerce landscape isn't just the domain of sites like Amazon, Brandless, or eBay. It's also home to high-end luxury goods. First Dibs is one of the premier names in that online space and recently raised $76 million in Series D funding. And last Wednesday, it announced a collaboration with the auction house Christie's. So now you don't have to wait to buy a $3,000 antique Italian white marble bust. You just go online and fill up your cart. Joining us in New York to discuss, First Dib CEO David Rosenblatt. David, nice to talk to you again. Uh, so this is almost a 20-year-old company, and you just raised a considerable amount of capital. Talk to us about what it means for First Dibs and how you're going to use it. The company is almost 20 years old. It was founded initially for the purpose of putting the Paris flea market, which is the premier antiques physical marketplace online. Since then, as you say, we've morphed into a marketplace for luxury design in general. Our fastest growing categories, in fact, are what we call new and custom or contemporary design and jewelry. We raised these funds from a combination of financial investors, T. Rowe Price was the lead investor, and also a strategic group, Artemis, which is the owner of Christie's and also the controlling shareholder of the Caring Group in Paris. And really, it's for the purpose of accelerating our growth in both new categories, like jewelry and contemporary design, and also to our fast-growing customer segments, the interior design community, as well as the luxury consumer. 
And David, tell us more about this uh, partnership with Christie's, so their parent company is an investor, and yet that's an auction business. Uh, how are they avoiding disrupting themselves by listing, I would imagine, a selection of their merchandise on First Dibs? It's a pretty complimentary fit. First Dibs is the largest digital marketplace for luxury design. One way to think about Christie's is that it's the largest offline or analog marketplace for luxury design. And so what this collaboration is, is it's the marketing of a collection curated by Christie's through a combination of both the First Dibs website and also our new 45,000 square foot gallery in New York City. And, and let me ask you about that gallery. I'm fascinated by these e-commerce firms that are now going omni-channel and opening up bricks and mortar locations. You guys are one of the first to do it. You know, how, how, how are the, uh, the physical locations complementary uh, to the online business? Well, you know, we sell design, uh, which for many buyers, it's important to touch and feel and see in person. And so while the, the showroom is big, it's about 45,000 square foot, as I mentioned, it actually only represents less than 1% of the product in our marketplace. Uh, and so for the customer for whom an in-person viewing is important, we offer that. For the majority of customers who are comfortable buying online, we offer that as well. And, da and David, do you expect to expand stores and opening, open them up outside of New York? We do. Uh, we only launched this one in February, so we're still in learning mode. However, it's grown much faster than we expected, uh, and it's doing quite well. We have a long wait list of our suppliers who are interested in exhibiting there, and it's been very popular among both designers and consumers. So yeah, you know, I think we would look at most of the major design centers as potential venues for a facility like this. And David, uh, First Dibs is no longer the only game in town when it comes to antiques or vintage online. There are companies like Cherish uh, that have been raising money. What does the new competition mean for you guys? Yeah, you know, I, I really don't um, view any of those direct competitors as, uh, as direct competitors for our business. Um, you know, as I mentioned, vintage and antique design, while it was the original core of the business and it's still an important part of what we do, um, it, it, you know, it no longer is our fastest growing category. Um, I view our competition, similar to many online disruptors, as offline alternatives for what we sell. We are many, many times bigger than our direct competitors, um, but still the majority of spend in this market happens offline, and that's the market we're gunning for. And is there friction uh, between you guys and some of those older offline channels, some of, some of the sellers that uh, primarily sell? to uh, physical stores? I think there's friction for digital in general and retail, traditional retail. Um, I don't think it's any different than, uh, than in any other market. And actually, most of our suppliers are interested in, in figuring out how to do digital and finding a digital channel. The existing incumbents online, like in Amazon, for example, is, is not geared towards the luxury market. Um, you know, the way we think about it is the race for the $50 order has been won by a combination of Amazon and Walmart in dollar terms. The race, however, for the $5,000 order has not been won. We sell roughly 50 orders a day above $5,000, and those are mostly from suppliers who would not be comfortable selling through an Amazon or a Walmart. Yeah, those are extraordinary numbers. David, one last question, and I can't not ask you this. Uh, you also sit on the board of Twitter, Jack Dorsey recently paying a visit to President Trump. I'm just curious how you counsel your, your CEO uh, on, on the topic of kind of balancing um, you know, extremist content on the platform, uh, but also making sure you're not tilting the service towards one political party or not. You know, it's, it's something that all social media CEOs have, have had to deal with recently. So I appreciate the interest, uh, but Jack does a, a great job re representing the company, and I would suggest you direct those questions to him and his team. Okay, David, that's fair enough. First of CEO David Rosenblatt, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Still ahead, are investors excited about Amazon's record-breaking profit as past investments pay off? We'll wrap up our coverage of Amazon's earnings next. This is Bloomberg. SNAP has tapped former McDonald's executive Kenny Mitchell to serve as its chief 
Marketing Officer. This marks the fourth addition to the executive ranks since November after several high-profile departures. As a former vice president at McDonald's, Mitchell oversaw the company's strategic brand and consumer marketing efforts in the U.S. And now back to Amazon. First quarter earnings are out, and the tech giant reported a profit of more than $7 a share, handily beating estimates. Amazon says it is still reaping the benefits of expansion investments made in 2016 and 17. So, so the big question now is, are investors more excited about a record-breaking profit, or will they be worried about more hiring and spending coming later this year? Joining us now, Guru Hariharan, Commerce IQ CEO and Amazon sales and advertising platform. Also with us, Jitendra Warall of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you both for joining us. Jitendra, first to you, a busy day in the tech sector, but for Amazon, the stock is now up 2% on this beat. Some concerns about next quarter. What do you, what do you make of the results? For the last four quarters, there's a trend over here. Inline uh, revenue, massive beat on profits. And basically, like, like you said, they're squeezing efficiencies out of the investments. Advertising uh, margin contribution continues to be strong. AWS growth continues to be strong. So what we are seeing the concern building about spending is you know, they're moving from prime two-day shipping to offer more prime one day uh, shipping to sort of secure their market share longer term and that's where the incremental spending uh, is going to come from apart from you know their expansion in AWS internationally logistics expansion content expansion things like that but what this quarter shows us is they are managing profits well so expect steady revenue growth story but uh, profit growth uh, longer term would be higher. Guru, one of the things I find so fascinating about Amazon now is that it's less and less a retail business and more and more an e-commerce marketplace. Now, you run a company that advises brands on how to sell to Amazon. You also, as I recall, worked at Amazon back in the day. You know, to what extent is this a sort of moving target for you and your, your colleagues? I mean, your clients, we talk about the 1P business, which you deal with. Uh, and Jeff Bezos, in his recent shareholder letter, said the third parties are kicking the one, one P piece. butt. But, yeah. Right. So what does that mean for you? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I think we, uh, as we see the um, uh, the trends that have happened uh, on Amazon in the last, call it eight quarters or so, uh, there's a significant shift that we see in Amazon focusing more on profitability as opposed to sales growth, and it's really coming off of Amazon's stated goals around being hands of the wheel, eliminating. Uh, people from various processes, uh, starting to launch private label goods, and also to your point, in sort of democratizing the marketplace in a way that 1Ps and 3Ps are starting to play on a more level playing field. For instance, what used to be available only for 1Ps like subscribe and save and Amazon marketing services are now available for 3Ps as well. So at the end of the day, the consumer's winning, but at the expense of 1Ps and 3Ps, trying to really compete with each other and all that profitability is taken away and passed on to the consumer. Well, any time a, a giant online marketplace makes changes like this, people complain, right? And marketplace sellers have been complaining. You know, the traditional complaint of the one piece seller who you work with has been counterfeits and fraud. Uh, Amazon's been trying to address this. Have, have they had success? Uh, I think they're making big strides. They're starting to think about uh, being very intentful about who is a one P and who is a three P. That is, if you're a brand manufacturer with a legitimate uh, manufacturing business, then you are a 1P. Ho uh, however, if you're a distributor or wholesaler or somebody who is um, uh, who's just uh, aggregating demand and selling it, they're starting to move to a more 3P platform. Uh, there are rumors of a program called One Vendor, which is launching with Amazon, where there's a stated goal of having three to 5,000 vendors on uh, the Amazon 1P platform and moving everybody else. Uh, the 1P business is not going away. It's just going to become a lot more consolidated to those who are legitimately brand manufacturers. Jitendra, one point of friction for many sellers has been the advertising business. They find now that they are mm -hmm. charged to appear high in search results. Some of them don't like it. Uh, yet in, in the earnings report, I noticed that it seems like the growth rate for that ad business had slowed considerably. Are we reaching some kind of limit for how fast Amazon can put ads and search results and on the site? So, uh, well, first of all, there was an accounting change last year. 
uh, where they used to count uh, cost or negative uh, cost of sales, and now they start booking in revenue. And that gave a one-time step, so we are dealing with that. Uh, so the deceleration is not as big as we think it is. And second, uh, if you take the other segment number, the ad business within it is going faster uh, than that segment. What we see happening is as the traffic goes and as Amazon goes after you know video uh, video ads in their app, they are they are do, uh, giving out more music services and things like that. They'll expand that ad inventory materially. Uh, as far as the pricing is concerned, you know. Theoretically, the ROI that Amazon can deliver on advertising should be the highest uh, out there because they have the data. They know exactly how, uh, how much uh, conversion you could get uh, from, from this advertising. So I think it will normalize the pricing, uh, but uh, right now the, I think the focus is on just driving profit margins by capturing these additional uh, ad inventories that are going to come online. We're seeing uh, that the, a lot of the arbitrage opportunities that used to be there about a year ago are starting to go away. That is, uh, it used to be uh, easier to get a good advertising cost to spend, which Amazon calls a cost, uh, to have a very lucrative return on investment on your ads business on Amazon as a 1P or a 3P. Now that is starting to taper off because everybody's jumping onto the bandwagon because everybody realizes this is the only closed loop system out there where you can truly measure the ROI of your spend. And I think the bar is now pretty high and you're gonna see that the cost of spend on Amazon is gonna just increase. Jitendra, last question to you. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. The physical stores, right? Growing in the low single digits. It, it, it shrank last quarter, so maybe it's an improvement. Right. But have they figured it out yet with Whole Foods and the bookstores and the four-star stores? This, this would be a longer-term uh, push for them. I mean, I think uh, the opportunity in groceries is online. You know, the physical stores, they'll have to physically expand the physical stores to actually see that growth. But uh, what they are seeing is all the price cuts helping uh, drive uh, growth a little bit more than what was before, but this will remain a single digit story for now. Okay, something for us to watch. Guru Hariharan, CEO of Commerce IQ, and Jitendra Waral of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you both for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And remember, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology, and be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.